and for the sake of Anata Kaundinya and all five of the bhikshus, three of the five bhikshus were relatives of the Buddha's father and two were relatives of the Buddha's mother. When the Buddha first left the palace to live the home life and cultivate the way in the Himalayas, his parents had sent these relatives along after him to try to convince him to return. At that time, the five bishops were not bishops, but high officials, and although they exhorted the Buddha to return, he would not. The five of them couldn't go back and face the king, the Buddha's father, without having accomplished their mission, so they stayed with the Buddha instead and accompanied him in cultivating the way. Of the three who were his father's relatives, one was called Jashvayit, the name means horse victory, one was called Bad. Rika, the name means little worthy, and the other was called Mahanama Kulika. The two on the mother's side were Anna Dagundinya and Dashabala Kashyapa, drinker of light, so named because he was a fire worshipper. The five stayed with the Buddha and cultivated ascetic practices. But eventually it became so bitter that three of them couldn't get and left. They backed out. The other two continued to cultivate with the Buddha. At that time, the Buddha was eating only one grain of rice and one sesam seed a day, and he became so emaciated that he was nothing but skin and bones. When one day a goddess brought him some milk gruel as an offering, he drank the guru and his body began to fill out again. The two who were cultivating with him got upset when they saw this and they said, How can someone who cultivates the way drink milk guru? And so they left too. There was a Shakyamuni Buddha in the midst of bitter cultivation and the five people his father and mother had sent to be with him or left him, three because they couldn't take the suffering and two because they saw the Buddha enjoying his blessings. The Buddha remained alone to cultivate. After he had cultivated there for six years, he went to sit under the Bodhi tree and on the eighth day of the twelfth month, he saw a star appear and became enlightened. At night, he saw a bright star and awakened to the way. After his enlightenment, he looked into the matter of who he should convert first and saw that it was Anatta Kaundinaya, one of the five bishops who in the past life had been the king of Kalinga and had cut the Buddha's body limb from limb. In that life, the Buddha had vowed that when he became a Buddha, the first one he would save would be the king of Kalinga. That is why when Shakyamuni Buddha became enlightened, he went first to the deer park and converted the five bishops. Shakyamuni Buddha said, For the sake of the five bishops, as well as for you, of the fourfold assembly. The fourfold assembly consists of the bishops, monks, missionaries, nuns, upasakas, lay men, and upasikas, lay women. I said, it is because living beings are impacted by gas dust and affliction that they do not realize the body or become a heart. Why don't living beings accomplish Buddhahood or become enlightened? Why don't they accomplish the first fruit of a hardship, the phrase gas dust? Also refers to your false thoughts. False thoughts are gas dust and affliction. You can also say that gas dust refers to the two kinds of delusion, view delusion and thought delusion. Afflictions can also be said to be delusions of ignorance and delusions as numerous as most of dust and sand. Why are people impacted by guest dust and affliction? Because people are really strange. They like to eat afflictions all day long, fix them good food, 
give them some good bread and butter, and they won't eat it. All they want to eat is afflictions, which they find more delicious than vegetable dumplings. Even if someone tells them not to eat affliction, they find it impossible to refrain from it. From morning to night, they eat nothing but gas dust and afflictions and fill their bellies full of anger instead of food. People like that are truly pathetic. Shakyamuni Buddha said, The reason all you living beings do not become Buddhas or Ahas is because you are impacted by gas dust and affliction. At that time, what caused you to have now realized the holy fruit to become enlightened? That time refers to the time when Shakyamuni Buddha went to the deer park and spoke with Dharma. You, the Buddha, means the five bhikshus and the fourfold assembly of bhikshus, bhikshunis, upasakas, and upasikas. The Buddha asks them now and why, them how and why they became enlightened. When he talked about gestures and affliction, what meaning did they see that caused them to obtain the fruition of a hardship? Sutra then Anna Dakaundinya arose and said to the Buddha, Of the elders now present in the great assembly, only I received the name understanding because I was enlightened to the meaning of the word gestures and realized the portion. Commentary Anatta Kaundinya was one of the five issues. His name is interpreted to mean understanding the fundamental limit and also the very first to understand because he was the first to understand and to be certified as having attained a hardship. Then Yanatta Kaundinya arose and said to the Buddha, Anaka Daka Undinya stood up and spoke to the Buddha of the elders now present in the great assembly. Only I received the name understanding because I was enlightened to the meaning of the word gestures and realized the fruition. He said, Now in this great assembly, I am an elder. I am older and much more experienced. Why did I receive the name understanding? Upon hearing the Buddha speak the word gestures, I understood the meaning and attained enlightenment. Anna Takaundinya will explain the meaning of gestures in the following passages. Sutra, World Honored One, it is like a traveler who stops as a guest at a roadside inn. Perhaps, for the night or perhaps for a meal. When he has finished lodging there and or when the meal is finished, he packs his baggage and sets out again. He does not remain there at leisure. The host himself, however, does not go far away. Commentary World Honored One Anathagawundinya said, Buddha, why was it that the two words gestures brought about my enlightenment. It is like a traveler who stops as a guest at a roadside inn, perhaps for, for the night or perhaps for a meal. A guest who is on a journey on a holiday looks for an inn where he can stay for a while. Perhaps he stays overnight there and or perhaps he goes there to eat. When he has finished lodging there at all, when the meal is finished, he packs his baggage and sets out again. When he has finished eating and sleeping, he readies his suitcases and goes on. He does not remain there at leisure. He is a guest. He can't live there all the time. The host himself, however, does not go far away. The host refers to the pure nature and bright substance of the permanently dwelling true mind. The guest refers to false thinking, the wearisome dust. Why is it compared to guest dust? Because it is not something fundamental to us. Our bodies are basically clean, but if we go out on a windy day, the dust may blow up and cover us, soiling our bodies. When we take our hands and brush away the dust, it disappears. What does this represent? It represents our afflictions and ignorance 
which are like a guest dust, they do not really exist. The guest is affliction and ignorance, the obstruction of affliction, the obstruction of what is known, the delusion of views and the delusion of thought. So Anaka Daka Undinia understood that the guest at an inn stays only temporarily, whereas the host in the inn always sleeps there. Sutra, considering it this way, the one who does not remain is called the guest, and the one who does remain is called the host. The word guest then means one who does not remain. Commentary Anadaka Undinya concludes, considering it this way, the one who does not remain is called the guest, and the one who does remain is called the host. We can also say that we recite our bodies temporarily as a guest does in an inn. We should understand that our bodies are merely an inn, not a natural home. They are not our own home, and so we shouldn't be too attached to them. But our host, the permanently dwelling true mind, never goes away, never ceases to exist. The word guest then means no one one who does not remain. So draw. Again, when the sky clears up, the morning sun rises with all resplendence and its golden rays stream into a house or through a crevice to reveal particles of dust in the air. The dust dances in the rays of light, but the empty space is motionless. Commentary. Again, when the sky clears up, the morning sun rises with all resplendence and its golden rays stream into a house through a crevice to reveal particles of dust in the air. When the sun has just come up early on a clear fresh morning, a morning after a rain, the sun shines through a crack in the door or perhaps a crack in the wall and it displays the fine piece of dust bobbing up and down in empty space, moving all around in the sunshine. The dust dances in the rays of light, but the empty space is motionless. If the sun doesn't shine in the crack, you can't see the dust, although there is actually a lot of dust everywhere. But while the dust moves and bobs up and down, empty space is still. It doesn't move. The ability to see the dust in the light that pours through the crack represents the attainment of the light of wisdom. When you certify to the fruit and reach the first stage of a hardship and overcome the 88 categories of view delusion, you have the light of wisdom. Then you can see your ignorance, which causes afflictions as numerous as the most of dust or grains of sand in the Ganges River. The sun of wisdom shines on the dust particles of affliction, as in Anataka Undinya's analogy of the sun shining through the crack. The dark caverns of ignorance are illumined, and you see the dust of affliction, and you understand. Sutra, considering it this way, what is clear and still is called space, and what moves is called dust. The word dust that means that which moves. Commentary, ignorance and afflictions as numerous as most of dust move, but empty space does not move. Empty space represents our seeing nature, which is also unmoving. It is the genuine host, our permanently dwelling true mind, which does not come and does not go. Considering it this way, what is clear and still is called space, Clear and still, it does not move, and that is called space. And what moves is called dust. The word dust then means with that which moves. You see the bits of dust in the patch of sunshine dancing and flying about seriously. What is this dust? It represents affliction, ignorance, the obstacle of affliction, and the obstacle of what is known. Attachment to those things is called dust. 
Every day you listen to the sutra, and I tell you not to have afflictions, and all you've got is afflictions. I tell you not to have ignorance, and all you do is display your ignorance. Would you call this being obedient? The more it is said that ignorance is not a good thing, the greater the ignorance becomes. When it is said that afflictions are good, the afflictions grow. Before it was discussed, there were no afflictions, but once it was brought up, the afflictions came forth. So it must be that my explanation of the sutra isn't a good explanation, because I haven't been able to explain away your afflictions. I hope you will all toss your afflictions into the Pacific Ocean. Don't look upon your afflictions as precious treasures. Don't treat afflictions as if they were your own kin. Don't let affliction be your playmate with birth and death. Don't be so affectionate towards them. You should toss your afflictions into the ocean, even though there are so many of them that they might well fill up. The entire ocean. Afflictions are demons. Where do you find demons and demonic ghosts? To have demonic ghosts is simply to have afflictions. You and the demons have gotten together. Afflictions are absolutely terrible, and the sutra is being explained just to teach people to get rid of their afflictions. So don't let it be that the more we speak of afflictions, the more they multiply. Sutra, the Buddha said, so it is. Commentary after Yanata Kaundinya finished speaking, the Buddha gave him positive certification. He said, what you have said is correct. The Buddha said, so it is. What moves is dust. What does not move is space. Your theory is not mistaken.